Today, we celebrate Dr. Fuller's achievements at a time when African-American physicians faced even more barriers than today. Today, we include presentations about Dr. Fuller's life and contributions to Alzheimer's disease, psychiatry, pathology, and neurology. You'll also hear about current Alzheimer's disease research and progress in recruitment, retention, and promotion of black students and faculty. I'd like to thank the departments of neurology, psychiatry, pathology, and laboratory medicine, diversity and inclusion, alumni association office, and the BU Alzheimer's Disease Research Center for putting this uh, symposia together for, and for sponsoring today's program. Continuing education credits for physicians and psychologists who are attending today's program and certificates of participation are available. Please see the chat for details about CME credit. You'll also receive an email tomorrow with instructions on how to claim your credit. So please enjoy the day. And I'll now turn things over to Dr. Michelle Durham, Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Education for the Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Durham. Thank you, Dean Antman, for those remarks and for um, welcome everybody to today's um, symposium, really celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Fuller. Um, we're so happy that some of his family could join today um, to celebrate him as we all are. What a legacy for all of us, especially for those of us um, that identify as black, um, that he has paved the way for many of us to, to be where we are today. Um, I have the pleasure um, of introducing Dr. Branson. And before I do that, um, I'm, I don't wanna wait till the end of the day to celebrate also and acknowledge our committee members for putting off, putting on this today. It was a, a team effort. And so I just like to recognize Dr. Turk in neurology, Samrana Bertrand, um, Roisha Young, um, Dr. Claire Krimble, and then Maria Ober, um, Dr. Um, Brian Moore from Pathology as well. And last but not least, um, Dr. Polk for actually um, giving us in the incentive and push to get this all together. So I just wanted to thank everybody. It was a few months of work. Um, and so we hope that you all enjoy today. Um, Dr. Chantel Branson completed her neurology residency, movement disorder and sleep medicine fellowship at BMC. She is an assistant professor of neurology at Morehouse School of Medicine and assistant adjunct professor of neurology at Boston University School of Medicine. She's the first movement disorder specialist at Morehouse School of Medicine. Today, her presentation will provide us a bit of the history and life and time of Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller. Um, with that, um, if you wanna know more about each of our speakers today and their bios as well, they can be found on the website. Um, we're giving snippets of the bios today, but their full bios can be found on the website. So Dr. Branson. Hi, my name is Dr. Chantel Branson. I'm a proud graduate of Boston University Medical School. I am currently an assistant professor of neurology at Morehouse School of Medicine, and I hold the position of adjunct assistant professor at Boston University. I would like to thank Drs. Michelle Durham, Catherine Turk, and Ms. Samrana Bertrand for the invitation and coordinating this event. I am honored to provide a historical focus about the life of Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller, who is not only a psychiatrist, but also a neurologist and a pathologist with a focus in neuropathology. So let's begin. Today, I will provide an overview of his childhood and teenage years in Liberia. I will review Dr. Fuller's early medical career matric matriculation through Boston University. I will provide several timelines of his accomplishments as a pioneer in Alzheimer's disease research. I will review his career as a neuropsychiatrist at Westboro State Hospital and Boston University. I will provide a brief overview of his wife's Mita Warwick's illustrious career as an artist prior to and after their marriage. I will also discuss Dr. Fuller's decision to leave Boston University due to pay inequities that still exist today. Solomon Carter Fuller was born in Monrovia, Liberia to freed American slaves who migrated from Virginia. His paternal grandfather bought his and his wife's freedom from slavery and subsequently moved to Liberia. His father, 
Solomon Carter Fuller was a coffee planter and sheriff of Mont Serrato County, Liberia. His mother, Anna Ursula James, was the daughter of medical missionaries. He spent his childhood and teenage years in Liberia. His father, Solomon Carter Fuller, died in March of 1889. In the fall of September of 1889, at the age of 17 years old, Dr. Fuller migrated to the United States to attend Livingstone College in Salisbury, North Carolina. Livingstone College was founded in 1879 for African-American students, and it was affiliated with the African-American Episcopal Church. Dr. Joseph Charles Price was president of Livingstone College during that time. He believed in a liberal arts education. He was also an inspiration and mentor to Dr. Fuller. In May of 1893, Dr. Fuller graduated with honors from Livingstone College. Dr. Joseph Charles Price died a few months after the graduation. In March of 1894, Fuller attended Long Island College of Medical School in Brooklyn, New York. It is currently owned under the NYU Langone with plans to become an ambulatory care facility in the future. In the summer of 1894, Dr. Fuller traveled to Boston, Massachusetts to inquire about a scholarship at Harvard providing financial assistance for black students. To his dismay, the scholarship was not available. Therefore, he walked around Boston until he found Boston University and introduced himself to the dean. During that conversation, he was able to apply and was accepted into Boston University Medical College. In the fall of that same year, Dr. Fuller transferred to Boston Medical College. During his matriculation, Dr. Fuller met Dr. Elmar Southard and became interested in the study of neuropathology. Dr. Southard was the director of the Boston Psychopathic Hospital and a member of the Boston University Medical School faculty. Dr. Edward P. Colby, which is not seen in this presentation, was also a professor of neurology who noticed Dr. Fuller and was impressed by his understanding and proficiency with the specialty. Dr. Colby introduced Dr. Fuller to Dr. George Adams, the superintendent of Westboro Insane Hospital. Dr. Fuller graduated from Boston Medical College in 1897 at the age of 25. Dr. George Adams, the superintendent of Westboro Insane Hospital, offered him an unpaid position as an intern for three to six months or work in the new pathological lab at Westboro for $20 a month, providing board, lodging, and laundry. Dr. Fuller accepted the second offer. During his time at Westboro, he was most interested in the medical and neurological conditions of the psychiatric patients. His main focus became neuroanatomical pathology. In July of 1898, Dr. Fuller was appointed head pathologist at Westboro Hospital. Despite his title, he received $30 a month compared to his younger white counterparts who received a starting salary of $50 a month. In 1899, Dr. Fuller was appointed to the director of the Clinical Society Commission of Massachusetts, distinguishing himself in the field of neuropathology. Dr. Fuller was appointed faculty at Boston University as an instructor in pathology. Dr. Fuller was one of the first black physicians appointed as faculty of an American medical school other than Howard and Meharry. In April of 1904, Dr. Fuller was granted six months leave of absence with half pay and two additional months without pay to study under Dr. Emil Krapelin. 
Chair of Psychiatry at the University of Munich in Germany. Dr. Fuller attended Kraepelin's lectures and clinic in the psychiatric hospital. He also attended autopsy lectures by Otto Bollinger, a pathologist, and Hans Schmaus in Anatomy of the Spinal Cord. Hans Schmaus introduced Dr. Fuller to Dr. Alzheimer. Dr. Fuller began to work with Dr. Alzheimer in his neuropathology lab and worked with him during the discovery of Alzheimer's disease. He also translated many of Dr. Alzheimer's work from German to English. Dr. Fuller in this picture is sitting down directly beside Dr. Alzheimer. In August of 1906, Dr. Fuller returned from Munich, Germany back to Westboro Insane Hospital as a pathologist and continued teaching at Boston Medical College. In 1907, Dr. Fuller published a case series describing the neuropathological features on autopsy of patients with conditions, including dementia paralytica, dementia senalis, and chronic alcoholism. The papers noted abnormal neuronal appearances and the presence of neurofibrils. Here is a picture of Dr. Fuller and the pictures beside him are the images of Westboro Hospital during that time. Now I wanna take a brief moment to discuss Dr. Fuller's better half, Mita Vo Warwick. She was born in 1877 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Her mother, Emma Jones Warwick, was a beautician and wig maker. And her father, William H. Warwick, was a barber. Mita attended the girls' high school in Philadelphia, where she became interested in art. She received a scholarship to attend the Pennsylvania Museum and School of Industrial Art, which is now known as Pennsylvania College of Art in 1893. She graduated in 1898 and traveled to Paris a year later. In 1899, she secured housing prior to her arrival to Paris. Upon her arrival, she was not allowed to live in the lodging due to the color of her skin. However, she did not leave Paris, but continued her studies and met several teachers. She also attended the World's Fair in 1900, which included organizers of the American Negro exhibit, such as W.E.B. Du Bois. In 1903, she returned to Philadelphia. In 1906, Dr. Fuller met Mita and wooed her with dinner, which included lobster, Newburgh, wine, pink and green ribbons, flowers, and ferns. She, pres she preserved the menu during, the enti during her entire life. In 1907, Mita became the first African-American woman to receive a U.S. government art commission when she was asked to create artwork for the Jamestown Tercentennial Exposition, a world fair marking the 300th anniversary of the founding of Jamestown and the Virginia colony. Dr. Fuller and Mita married in 1909 and lived in Framingham, Massachusetts throughout their entire life. Mita continued her work as an artist after marriage. She purchased an art studio near her home in Framingham. In 1913, W.E.B. Du Bois asked Mita to contribute to the New York celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation's 50th anniversary of the abolishment of slavery. She created a piece called Emancipation Group. Emancipation 
piece is in the this piece is in the Harriet Tubman Square in Boston, Massachusetts. Another piece she created called the Ethiopian Ethiopian Awakening is in the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. Let's review the timeline of Dr. Fuller's monumental research and discovery. In 1902, Dr. Fuller began working at Bellevue Medical College in New York with Professor Edward Dunham to obtain additional pathological technical skills. Professor Edward spent one year working in Berlin in Robert Koch's lab. In 1903, Dr. Fuller was selected to participate in groundbreaking research with Dr. Alzheimer, as previously discussed. He was only one of five scientists and the only American to be offered this opportunity. He began his work at the Royal Psychiatric Hospital in the University of Munich, which opened in 1904. In 1905, he continued his role as a neuropathologist while intersecting his clinical psychiatry practice to interpret the findings seen on pathology. He started a journal known as the Westboro State Hospital Papers. In 1907, Dr. Fuller published a case series describing the neuropathological features on autopsy of patients diagnosed with conditions including dementia paralytica, dementia senilis, and chronic alcoholism. In it, he reported abnormal neuronal appearances and the presence of neurofibrils in cases of dementia senilis and dementia paralytica, while also recognizing the influence of Kraepelin and Alzheimer in furthering his career in Germany and their input in dementia research to date. Much of Dr. Fuller's extensive research has been documented by Dr. Tia Powell, and many of the next slides will feature the work and studies that she has done with reviewing Dr. Fuller's literature. In 1907, Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller published a study of the neurofibrils in dementia paralytica, dementia senilis, and chronic alcoholism, cerebral Lewis, and microcephalic idiocy. This was published in the American Journal of Insanity. To highlight a portion of the abstract, it says that great caution must be exercised in the interpretation of the alterations which the neurofibrils present in material from pathological sources. Dr. Fuller's first known article was the most comprehensive publication of this time. The length of Dr. Fuller's article was 67 pages, including plate of drawings and photographs, which are illustrated here. A few are illustrated here. The paper provides an in-depth detail of neurofibrils. Dr. Fuller discusses the breakdown or degeneration of neurofibrils in the brain based on their pathological findings. He also provides clinical cases of patients with pathological findings that correlate with the disease symptomatology of senile dementia. I just wanna read again briefly the abstract and just some of Dr. Fuller's amazing writing at that time. It's, uh, it's not only profound, prolific, but he was a visionary. He was completely ahead of his time. Uh, so now I'm going to read uh, from the abstract and just a few more um, of, from the introduction. It has been indicated throughout this paper that great caution must be exercised in the interpretation of the alterations which the neurofibrils present in material from pathological sources. A caution which in the light of our present knowledge cannot be too strongly emphasized. The writer believes nevertheless 
from a study of these 14 cases and 40 others which have been examined in the laboratory of the Westboro Insane Hospital, but not reported, and after due consideration of the objections which have been raised, that alterations in the neurofibrils, which might well be considered pathological, may be demonstrated in the cerebral cortex of persons dying insane. I am going to begin to speak briefly about the differences between Dr. Alzheimer's and Dr. Fuller's research in dementia. In order to do that, I want to give a historical background about what Dr. Alzheimer's research has done, which I'm sure many of you all know. Um, in November of 1901, Alzheimer was asked to examine the records and brain of Mrs. August Dieter. She was otherwise healthy at the beginning of March of that same year. She was reported by her husband to be strolling inappropriately with a female neighbor. Two months later, she began making mistakes in preparing meals, having difficulty with her finances. By November, she was unable to remember her name and became bed bound. She died of complications of dementia in 1906 at the age of 55 years old. Dr. Alzheimer published two papers on the disease, which was named after him by Emil Kraepelin in 1910. Dr. Alzheimer linked the clinical symptoms with the tangled neurofibrils. Dr. Fuller presented several cases. One of them included a woman in her 50s, same age, dying of dementia. Her brain showed no tangled neurofibrils. She had plaques, but not large nor numerous. The thought today is that this patient may have met what we call uh, frontal temporal dementia, may, may have met the criteria for that today. Dr. Fuller also did not want to distinguish the pathological findings in patients with dementia from the old versus the young, is what the terminology was called called at that time, so that's how they described dementia patients. And he didn't want to classify them in, based on their ages. Dr. Fuller expands on the definition of a dementia. He reports there is not enough evidence to separate, as stated before, based on the terminology that was used at this time, at that time, dementia in the young from the old. 16 years after Dr. Fuller's research, Alzheimer's disease was expanded to include dementia in the old and young with senile plaques and tangles. Dr. Fuller also produced a paper on plaques in the brain. This paper analyzed the connections between plaques of dementia and old age. He compared the brains of 33 elderly patients dying insane with 50 young patients dying of mental illness and six elderly patients who died without mental illness. The plaques during that time were initially thought to be caused by arterial sclerosis. Based on his extensive research, he was able to determine that the plaques were not caused by arterial sclerosis, but also neither necessary nor sufficient for dementia. This scientific argument has been discussed for approximately 100 years. There have been companies trying to make medications using this research that these plaques can be related to dementia, and if you remove the plaques, then you, you can treat dementia. Dr. Fuller was just a, ahead of his time. In 1912, Dr. Fuller published in two parts, the first comprehensive review of Alzheimer's disease at that time, as well as reviewing 11 known cases and translating Alzheimer's original case in English for the first time. He also described then in the ninth recorded case of the disease. He published 
several other cases on neurological disorders that were unrelated to Alzheimer's disease. We just have a few here. Two cases of multiple sclerosis with obscure neurological and mental symptoms. Purulent streptococcus cerebrospinal meningitis. A case of multiple papilloma of the brain, a case of Huntington's chorea with late onset, I just want to quote Dr. Fuller here. He states, it is hoped that freedom from the annoyances of administrative details will bring the opportunity for elaboration of his views on the treatment of the insane and that his rich experiences will find some permanent record for the benefit of his co-workers in this important field of medicine. Let's review the timeline of Dr. Fuller's illustrious academic career. Dr. Fuller began his career in 1898 at Westboro State Hospital and subsequently resigned in 1919. He continued to work as faculty member in the Department of Neurology and Psychiatry at Boston Medical College. He was also a consulting neurologist at Massachusetts Memorial Hospital. In 1928, Dr. Fuller was appointed head uh, what we now may call interim chair of the neurology department. His duty included responsibilities of the chief of the department, but he was never given the formal title and remained an associate professor. In 1933, after 34 years of teaching, Fuller retired from Boston University after a white assistant professor was promoted to full professor and head of the neurology department. He continued to work until his death in January 16th of 1953 as a psychiatrist in Framingham. In reflection of his years with inequity of pay, during his years of at Boston University and throughout his entire life. He stated, I thoroughly dislike publicity of that sort and despise sympathy. I regard life as a battle in which we win or lose. As far as I am concerned, to be vanquished, if not ingloriously, is not so bad after all. With the sort of work that I have done, I might have gone farther and reached a higher plan had it not been for my color. We have a beautiful portrait of Dr. Fuller's family where he practiced as a psychiatrist until 1953. This picture was taken between 1944 and 1945 in front of their family home on 31 Warren Road in Framingham. According to Solomon Carter Fuller III, their family were the only black family during his time there until he left Framingham in 1960. Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller is pictured on the opposite of his three sons with his grandchildren sitting in his lap. His wife, Mita, is on the bottom stoop sitting, holding their granddaughter, who is also named Mita. The three sons, starting from the top to the bottom, include William Thomas Harry, Solomon Carter Fuller Jr. Thomas's wife, Harriet, is sitting across from Perry. At the bottom row, we have Solomon Carter Fuller Jr. sitting with Solomon Carter Fuller III standing in front of his father. Mita Fuller, again, is holding, is being, sitting on the lap of her grandmother, Mita, and Marie Solomon Carter Fuller III's 
Solomon Carter Fuller Jr.'s wife is holding their newborn, Robert Mita. Robert. I would like to provide a timeline of Dr. Fuller's legacy uh, after the end of his career and subsequently after his death as well. In 1943, Dr. Fuller received an honorary doctorate of science degree at Livingstone College. In 1971, the Black Psychiatrist of America distinguished Dr. Fullerman for being the first Black psychiatrist in America. In 1973, a one-day conference was held at Boston University in honor of Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller. In 1974, the Solomon Carter Fuller Mental Health Center was developed at Bo in Boston, Massachusetts, allowing mental health services to provide it to be provided throughout the state. In 1995, Fuller Middle, Middle School was named after Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller in Framingham, Massachusetts. More recently, Thank you so much, Dr. Branson, for such a wonderful and insightful presentation. It really set up the day for us on what a legacy um, Dr. Fuller had. Um, a couple of things that sort of stood out to me and towards the end is that he was before his time. Um, and the second thing that you mentioned towards the end is how do we honor him fully for all of his contributions? Um, what a legacy he did have. Um, so it's such a powerful presentation. Um, and it really sets up our next uh, presenters and panel, which the family will participate in, led by Dr. David Henderson, who is the chief and chair of psychiatry here at Boston Medical Center, Boston University School of Medicine, and a professor of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine. So um, Dr. Henderson. Great, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Um, it's an honor to be here in a celebration of um, Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller, um, uh, as you heard in the previous presentations, um, an amazing career, but also filled with um, challenges of his time, but also um, these challenges are, are persistent even in our times, hundreds of years later or more. Um, so as the uh, chair of psychiatry, um, I uh, want to acknowledge that um, Dr. Um, Fuller really was a, a trailblazer. And um, he, he um, kind of set in action um, processes for psychiatrists to, to really bring science uh, to the field. And it, um, it, it really is it's quite amazing. I've um, had the honor of um, uh, first uh, you know, working in Liberia where Dr. Fuller uh, was from and and to hear the history, uh, his history from the Liberians who, who all knew him, um, particularly in, in, the, in the medical field uh, was, was truly uh, amazing. And, and they were so proud of his accomplishments. And in fact, um, you know, prior to the, um, you know, 20 years of conflict, Liberia probably had the best um, health and, and mental health system in Western in West Africa. Um, and so in, inspired by um, the work of Dr. Fuller um, in, in particular. I also want to uh, acknowledge that the, in 1971 with the Black Psychiatrist of America um, uh, naming uh, Dr. Fuller the first Black psychiatrist in the United States, um, uh, this is a, was an, a, an important acknowledgement that he was not only a neurologist, but he was a psychiatrist and a pathologist. Um, so he was a, really a, a, a triple threat and, and extremely unusual. Um, as it turns out, uh, the Black Psychiatrist of uh, America was uh, founded by uh, uh, one of my mentors um, named Chester Pierce. And, and in mentoring me, he often talked about um, um, Dr. Fuller and, and the, the process that he went to, through, but also um, the the importance of of science and 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 pursuing science, and he said to me that you know you really have to be a historian to be a good scientist. You really have to understand who went before you, who who examined 
um, areas and problems and and what were their findings and then maybe you have new tools now to take it to the to next level. Um, so so Dr. Fuller has had an impact on um, numerous, I, I believe, psychiatrists, neurologists, and pathologists, uh, both um, black and non-black. Um, and so, um, and I'd like to introduce first Dr. Andrew Butson, who is Chief of Cognitive and Behavioral Neurology and Associate Chief, Chief of Staff for Education at VA Boston Healthcare System. <clears throat> he is also the Associate Director of Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and a Professor of Neurology at Boston University School of Medicine. He's also a lecturer in neurology at Harvard Medical School. He recently sat down for a conversation uh, with Ms. Va Valerie Nolan. And Ms. Nolan is a dedicated member of Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. She's uh, been associated with the center for many, many years as a senior facilitator for the Community Action Council and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Partnership within the Department of Neurology. She serves as a liaison to build in-kind partnership between community leaders, clinicians, and educators in supporting Alzheimer's disease research, education, and awareness. She is a champion um, <clears throat> in the advocacy and outreach to legislatures, legislators and serves as a minister to connect with spiritual leaders and, um, and serving families and communities of color. And now I'll turn to Dr. Butson and Ms. Nolan. Val, I want to thank you so much for uh, chatting with me uh, this afternoon to talk a little bit about your role in our Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and all of its different uh, activities. And you have been part of the center longer than I have. And yeah. I have been part of the center since like, uh 2005 so so i don't even want to count all the years but that's a lot of years so tell us, how, how did you first become involved in our center well first of all dr butson thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak about where we are on this journey my pleasure well, thank you Initially, as a business professional, and that's from information technology, project management, all of those roles, I'm traveling everywhere. So my family, we, we live between Ohio and born in Ohio, and then my parents were in Alabama. And my story starts by me speaking with my mother, I have, I had two sisters and two brothers. And my sister was a geriatric social worker. And she was preparing to retire. So mom gives me a ring and we're all excited about the retirement party and, and what we'd be doing and everything. But she says to me, I need for you to come home now something's wrong with your sister. So I'm very tenderhearted. So I got to a place where I could say, what do you mean? She said, just come home as soon as you can. So cancel travel. And I went to Alabama. And there, my sister was there with my mom. And it wasn't my sister. I, I looked at her and I looked at my mother and I said to them, to mom, let me hug my sister. She said, well, be careful with her because I don't know. I know she loves you from the bottom of her heart and, and you've always been her special one, but just be careful. So I went over and, and gave her a hug, but she wasn't there, the sister that I knew. So I said to mom, well, we have to get her to a doctor. So we made an appointment that was urgent for me. I told them I was traveling and I need to get her here. 
and they examined my sister, the doctors were husband and wife. And after the examination, they came back and they said to me, we're sorry, we missed it. So I don't know what they're talking about. I said, my sister is not here, she's gone. And we're sorry, I was sad, I was angry, I was upset, not knowing what to do. Sure, so yeah. I, I got the, I took the next plane uh, back to Boston, uh, canceled any business trips I had for the time. And I said to, who did I meet first? I was over in the Bedford office with uh, Dr. Cowell's group. Yeah. And I started our, our, our director of our center. Yeah. Director of the center. And I started to ask questions. And as I asked these questions, they uh, told me what it what what it was and what it what happens. And I said, wow, I knew nothing about this. So, so Long what story was, short, I, I yeah. did not know anything yeah. about so, so what was the diagnosis that your sister was given? That she had dementia. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I don't know what that means, but thank you. And I said some, a few unkind words to them very professionally. And, and then I left. And what, 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 excuse me, what, what year was that, that, uh, that you, you were doing this and talking with Dr. Cowell. This was like, I looked at my profile, it was like 2002. Mm -hmm. So I said, I don't know what's going on here, but I know what has happened to me. I never want to see happen to another person on the planet. And that's when I just asked, you know, I'm very inquisitive anyway, but again, um, I, had, I met Michael Kincaid. He's one of the community leaders. Yeah. And he was able to help me to navigate. I said, uh, my words were, I need to know as much as I can about what's going on here and why don't we know now? So I had quite a few sessions with the director and he's a great listener and I was crushed. And, and, and he, well, and, and then I got started. So I ended up traveling across the US, learning what a research center was and where they're located and what they're doing and, and I went back to Europe. I lived and worked there. And so I went to Spain and Berlin. That's where I encountered uh, Dr. Carter's name. Yeah, so, so, tell, so tell everyone, what does the BU Alzheimer's Disease Research Center Community Action Council, what does it do and what role do people play on it? Well, I believe that there's power in numbers. So the more you can find the kindred spirits that are looking for other kindred spirits to work together for the greater good of families and communities across the board. And that's from the po uh, political side, always advocacy, uh, communication, uh, getting to know each other. Organizations don't make a team, but people, people are the ones. Plus, they are the leaders. And I would say, you know, you're accountable. If you're a community leader, what does that mean? I mean, we have a whole community of people that are innocent and naive as I to learn about what's really going on. And you have this language here. Oh, we say, underrepresented. This is an underrepresented community, not that the 
attempts haven't been there, but they haven't been able to influence people and rally to get things done. So we take it a step by step. And that's a mission that I will be on until I'm gone and then some. There have been some great leaders that have uh, gone before me and gave me great conversations and some sad history about things that have happened in the uh, community. But before the stigma was there, we don't talk about that. I said, well, how can we? And then I stopped and paused and I said, well, if not you, then how about your children and your grandchildren? I would like for it to be just as cancer. Everyone knows about, what do you call it? Alzheimer's, dementia. Everyone knows that it's important that we understand what's going on when a family member member is going through many things. Your books have been absolutely wonderful. The, the feedback that comes because as a community well leader in, in this town, it took me many years to get to this point. It wasn't very nice at first. I said, well, I'm very diverse. I persevere. And after a while, you'll get to like me. And I'd like to thank you very much for the Dementia Friendly. We understand that we have over a thousand people, families in this town that have family members. So I took that to the CAC and I said to the, the meeting, wow, look at all of this work that we have to get done. So I've talked to our legislators, uh, congressmen and senators, and they are also touched. I've been on Capitol Hill, helping all of them to understand, and they basically all have the same story. Yes, we have a family member like that too. I said, okay, so how can we raise funny, waste, raise funding to rally together for the greater good? And how about research? Oh, don't talk to us about that. I said, all right. So this is what I'll do. I'll talk to you every time I see you about this. And then after a while, I won't have to say anything because I anticipate and hope that you'll be joining me on this journey. And it's starting to happen. Wonderful, wonderful. In, in the research space, and I, I said, I understand that you're apprehensive. I said, but I also understand how important it is for confront our fears, recognize them, find someone to talk to about it. You can talk to me and then we can go forward because I had to do the same thing myself. And I didn't have anyone, no one in the family. It's a family thing as well. And they really would like to see your face and see what you have to say. And, and I, that's what I told the leaders. You know, you're the ones that are in these positions, given these, the scope of these red line neighborhoods that you're supposed to be studying. And I want to see you on team. Yeah. And especially where we are today with the isolation. Uh, with the uncertainty, with the unprecedented times, with our young people. That's another thing that I've learned. You don't have to be an elder to mm -hmm. start having memory problems. So Val, you know, we're, you're uh, talking about, uh, you know, doing some of the research and you've been participating in uh, studies at our center you know, I think probably since around, you know, 2002, if not, you know, maybe a year or two later. And, you know, what, why do you do it? What do you find, you know, fulfilling or rewarding or satisfying about participating in the studies? Well, I'm very inquisitive. And I said, where is the data? You know, that's my business side. They say, we don't have data like that, Val. I said, oh, 
Oh, I know. And I can go to some sessions and there the room is full. And I look around for people that I know that should be in that room uh, listening and, 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 lear and learning. We have to be continuously listening and learning and, and meeting the needs. And it's been, this is 2022. It's been 20 years. And I'm so thankful and grateful. I see more progress today since you came on board and the bright light and the fire and the energy that's around research is an answer to a prayer because I knew it had to go. I'm a technology geek as well. I can't help that. And so in, the, in regards to research, Hope has to be alive. We have to be hopeful one day at a time. We have to keep a positive attitude. Now, how did I get into uh, research? I said, the first, it was paper. Oh boy, I thought, oh my goodness. How long is this gonna take? With our wonderful manager there, Eric. Thank so you. You're talking, you're talking about the pencil and paper testing that you were doing pencil as part of the studies? Paper. Yes. I only had to do that twice, pencil and paper testing. I said, okay, so I'm a technology geek. I can be automating this. So sure enough, now I am on my smartphone. I know a lot of people play games and, and draft king and all of those things. I said, no, I don't play games. I, I just don't play games. But if there's a, a study, that I can on my smartphone, yes. And in fact, I'll be completing one in about six weeks, two months. So, but so I saying, don't ever. I'm sorry, you're saying one of the studies you're doing with our center, you're actually doing it on your smartphone. Absolutely. Wow. Yes. So that that's that's really wonderful you know I'm, I'm really glad you spoke about that because i think when people hear about alzheimer's research they think it's all about like taking a new drug or a new medicine and they also think usually that you have to have alzheimer's to participate in research but what you've just explained is that although we do have some research like that there's a Absolutely. lot of research going on that uh, healthy older individuals can participate in. And a lot of it has no medicines at all. Some of it, you do an MRI scan or a PET scan or an EEG electrodes uh, stuck to your head. Some of it, like you were just talking about, can be a smartphone or a, a questionnaire. So there's a lot of different types of research that people can participate at our center or if you're watching this remotely at one of the other uh, national institutes on aging alzheimer's disease centers across the country mm -hmm. so i encourage everyone to realize that is that we have to own this we have to own because the days of sitting with dr welby and and then and dr cosby are done there's no time, there's so many of us, but if we rally together, we can get things done. But it's very important that we keep a positive attitude. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's wonderful. So, you know, you've talked a little bit about this, this issue, uh, uh, but I wanted to just have you sort of address it explicitly. You know, why is it important for people who identify as black or other underrepresented groups in this country, why is it important that they participate in Alzheimer's disease research? Well, there's one simple answer. We don't have information. We don't have data. We don't have anything to work with. And that's where the need is. It's, you're not, a, a puppet on a string. You're learning, 
as well as participating in the future that can help your own family and, ha and have a conversation. Or, uh, praise God now, it's on television. It took forever for us to get to that point. But, you know, you might give out, but you never give up. Absolutely. That's such an important message. Well, you know, I, I really want to thank you, Val, for, for speaking with us uh, today and being part of our, our day-long celebration of the, the life and the work and the legacy of, of Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Butson. You're wonderful and you do an excellent job. And I'm so happy to still be on team. <laughs> Thanks again. That's great anticipation. Wonderful excitement. Thank you both so much um, for that wonderful conversation. And it's just an inspiration how long um, Valerie Nolan has been um, involved in Alzheimer's disease research and, and the contributions she's made to community partnerships with our center are, are just astounding. So next we're gonna be turning to Miss um, Lola Baird. Ms. Baird is a licensed independent clinical social worker in the state of Massachusetts, and she has experience providing mental health care and social work. Uh, she's a current trainee at our university's Alzheimer's Disease and Research Center in our Research Education Component, or REC Scholar Program. Her goal is to use research to better understand the effects of structural disadvantages, including neighborhood violence, on health outcomes with the goal of creating innovations and interventions that might mitigate the impact of these structural disadvantages. And next we'll turn to Ms. Baird. My name is Lola Baird and I'm a clinical social worker with the Boston VA healthcare system where I have worked since 2012. My social work practice has allowed me to directly witness how our social environments can inhibit or support our desires to succeed in life. In the last few years, I have worked on translating my clinical experiences into research. My research interests include examining the social conditions that may influence an individual's risk of developing long-term chronic diseases such as Alzheimer's. In the fall of 2021, I was selected as a scholar with the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias Research Education Component Program. I am so thankful for the experience because with the support of Dr. O'Connor and the REC program, it has allowed me to further develop my research question, which is how neighborhood, neighborhood violence may contribute to the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. I also wanna take a moment to thank Dr. Butson and Dr. Turk from the Center for Translational Cogn Cognitive Science for this opportunity to speak today as we honor the legacy of Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller and the important work he has accomplished in Alzheimer's disease research. A diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease will have a significant impact on not only the individual diagnosed, but also their family unit. As the course of Alzheimer's disease progresses, a patient's ability to manage their ADLs diminishes significantly while their care needs drastically rise. This often leads to a complex dynamic within the family unit as they learn and navigate new caregiving roles. By 2030, 6.9 million Black Americans in the United States over the age of 65 will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. This rate has more than doubled since 1995. However, despite this increase, Black Americans are underrepresented in Alzheimer's disease-related research, including clinical trials for potential treatments and interventions. In the United States, around 13% of the population identifies as Black or African American, while in Alzheimer's disease-related research, about 5% of participants are Black or African American. The lack of representation contributes to this knowledge gap. However, there is more attention on this issue and there are several risk factors that need further exploration. There are several potential modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. My research focuses on stress, which is known to have harmful impact on an individual's psyche and their physical health. Stress is known to contribute to diagnoses such as hypertension, obesity, and depression, 
all of which are thought to increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's. I also want to highlight the term prolonged stress, which will bring us to the next point. Health outcomes related to prolonged stress and relatedly prolonged traumatic stress is at the core of the research question I am examining. A central feature of the work extrapolates that Black Americans are subject to unique stressors, specifically racism, that can influence all aspects of living. This is not to say that only Black Americans are impacted by racism, but the slavery practices of colonists in early American history created a distinctive subtext for Blacks in this country. Racist policies enacted following the Civil War, before the Civil Rights Movement, and arguably more recent history, created long-term impacts that have carried into multiple generations of Black American families. One such policy was redlining, which had been used as a method of segregating communities by denying home loans to racial minorities in predominantly white and or affluent neighborhoods. Areas with a sizable population of Blacks were red inked, which effectively was used to discourage lenders from investing in those areas. Obtaining approval for business loans or home construction loans was very difficult for individuals who lived in redlined areas. This practice of collective discrimination in the loan process allowed neighborhoods to fall into disrepair. While the practice of redlining based on ethnicity is now illegal in the United States, the repercussions of the practice are still felt today. Segregated neighborhoods are more likely to be disadvantaged with relation to lack of community resources, lack of effective policing, and lack of social trust. This concentrated disadvantage also leads to poorer health outcomes of the residents. An additional consequence of redlining is the creation of food deserts. Engaging in healthy food practices and following the standard recommendations of physicians requires access to supermarkets. It is perhaps unsurprising to learn that super, supermarket redlining was also practiced. Nice neighborhoods like the one pictured here benefited from community investment. Residents of neighborhoods that were not redlined were more likely to obtain the necessary financing to pay for expenditures that would keep their homes nice and updated and support the growth of local business. Collective neighborhood disadvantage or distress is highly correlated with neighborhood violence and crime. People of color, including Blacks, are more likely to live in neighborhoods with high crime rates. Structural disadvantage contributed to a lack of opportunities for residents, which may influence the incidence of crime in segregated areas. The elevated or even constant threat of victimization from violent crime, witnessing criminal activities, and loss of friends and family members related to violence are features of a Criterion A trauma. Experiencing a criterion A trauma is necessary for a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. But what if there is no post and trauma exposure is sustained for significant portions of an individual's life? Are strategies to cope with community or neighborhood violence contributing to adverse health outcomes or diagnoses such as Alzheimer's disease? Some studies have noted that neighborhood crime may impact cognitive functioning as well as increase the risk of developing health conditions that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. The first question being explored is whether there is a statistically significant relationship between Alzheimer's disease and related dementias and neighborhood violence. To answer this first question, we obtained publicly available data for a few New England states, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. The data is from the Healthy, Healthy Aging Report, which is funded by the Tufts Health Plan Foundation. The report provides comprehensive community profiles for 797 towns in the region. The data includes variables of particular interest to this research study, which was the rate of Alzheimer's disease in communities and a few different crime-related variables, including 
homicide rates, property violence, and violent crime. Represented on the y-axis is the rate of Alzheimer's disease measured in each location. On the x-axis is the rate of violent crime per 100,000 residents. As can be seen here, these variables are significantly and positively related such that as rates of violent crime increase, so do the rates of Alzheimer's disease. I present this preliminary data with the disclaimer that correlation does not equal causation. But you can see here that there does appear to be a significant correlation between the rate of violent crime and incidence of Alzheimer's disease in a community. A simple linear regression model also showed that violent crime in a community does explain a statistically significant proportion of variance in Alzheimer's disease rates. While there is a relationship, further research and data analysis is needed to understand what is, what is behind this connection and how that relationship is impacted by other known and accepted risk factors of Alzheimer's disease. Understanding the impact of sustained or continuous exposure to trauma on later life health outcomes is important as our population ages. Highlighting inequities in the social environment allows for a more nuanced view of the person in their environment. It is not enough to know there is an inequity. Moving forward requires acknowledging the uncomfortable truths so innovation and innovative approaches to Alzheimer's disease is equitably distributed. I wanna thank you for the time today as we honor the life and legacy of Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller. Thank you so much for that uh, excellent talk, Lola. Um, it's clear that you've um, made so much progress in the short time that you've been a REC scholar. Um, and answering these important questions about how um, the environment and the circumstances we live in may affect Alzheimer's disease risk. Um, next, I'd like to turn to another member of our Alzheimer's disease research community. Ms. Raisha Young is the recruitment coordinator at our center. She is also a member of the Outreach Recruitment and Engagement Corps team. Um, that works to facilitate the recruitment and retention of research participants. She's actively working in the community. She seeks ways to educate families about Alzheimer's disease clinical research. And she endeavors to build relationships with potential research participants, especially those from underserved communities. Ms. Young? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raisha Young. I am the recruitment coordinator here at Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And I'll be sharing a little bit about who we are and what we do here at our center. A little bit of background, we were established in 1996 and we are one of 37 Alzheimer's disease centers funded by the National Institute on Aging. Our faculty and researchers are affiliated with Boston University School of Medicine and or the VA healthcare system. Also, our staff are professionally trained in medicine, public health, and other related fields. Our mission here is to reduce the human and economic costs of Alzheimer's disease through the advancement of knowledge. Our three objectives our research, care, and education. To carry out this mission, one of our initiatives is the Community Action Council. This council works with community members to conduct quality, inclusive research by ensuring adequate representation of African-American participants in both the HOPE Registry and other studies. Also, we partner with the Alzheimer's Disease Association to participate in the annual Walk to End Alzheimer's Disease. And this year's Walk to End Alzheimer's Disease in Cambridge will be held on October 16th. So please save the date. Also, we have a student ambassador program in which we welcome college students from across the Boston area to be 
further educated on what is Alzheimer's disease so that they would be empowered to then go out into the community and raise awareness about Alzheimer's disease through various outreach events. Also, Memory Sunday is an annual campaign to raise awareness about Alzheimer's disease. Memory Sunday is annual campaign to raise awareness about Alzheimer's disease. Memory Sunday is planned by a committee dedicated to raising awareness of Alzheimer's disease among African Americans by partnering with various faith-based leaders to visit their congregation to talk about what is Alzheimer's disease, the different types of resources um, that they can take advantage of, as well as how to get involved in current research. This year's Memory Sunday will be on June 12th. It, it, it will be in both in person as well as held virtually on Zoom. So if you would like more information, you can contact me and my contact information will be um, given at the end. I have numerous educational talks in the community encouraging brain health and healthy lifestyle. It's very important to take advantage of the different things that we can all do now to strengthen our, our brain health. And one of those ways is the Mediterranean diet has been proven to promote brain health. And this diet includes fish, vegetables, olive oil, avocado, fruits, nuts, and beans. Additionally, sleep, exercise, and diet, as mentioned before, are also very important, as well as social functioning. Social functioning is engaging in social activities, whether it's hanging, um, being around friends and family, or um, being included in a book club. Additionally, there are strategies that you can take advantage of, such as having a daily routine that helps you uh, remember to take care of daily tasks, such as when you um, enter a room or enter your house and you put down your keys, at a designated um, place or writing down important dates and appointments on a calendar. Furthermore, we have a number of different research studies that we are recruiting, recruiting for in um, various different uh, categories, such as memory and aging studies. These studies, <clears throat> These studies help us learn about the changes that occur in people's memory as they age. Clinical trials help us to determine if a new or currently used medication can, be, can prevent Alzheimer's disease or slow its progression. Genetic studies help us to understand genetic factors associated with Alzheimer's disease. Next, there are caregive, caregiver or caregiving studies that focus on, on issues related to activities in daily life. And these studies, we welcome individuals who are caring for someone who has memory loss or Alzheimer's disease or some type of dementia. Lastly, imaging studies help, it, um, help us to learn how these help us to learn how brain images can provide more information about diagnosing and detecting Alzheimer's disease early when treatments are most effective. And here are some of our current research participants um, who are participating in one or more of our studies. Lastly, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. Again, my name is Rorisha Young, and here is my email address. It is youngra at bu.edu, and our website is here listed here as well. And please feel free to follow us on um, Twitter and Facebook and check out our, our YouTube channel. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Raisha, for sharing a little bit about our center. And I encourage anyone watching who'd like to get involved to reach out to Raisha. Um, 